Well, let's make it really simple, okay? Thoughts are the language of the brain. Mm -hmm. Feelings are the language of the body. Mm -hmm. So the currency of thought is what creates a certain level of mind. The currency of feeling, then, has everything to do with experience, okay? So knowledge is for the mind, experience is for the body. So your brain has networks of neurons that are arranged in certain patterns based on things you learn intellectually and things you've experienced in your life. So your forebrain is the builder, it's the designer, it's the CEO. And when you begin to speculate possibilities, when you start to think about a better way to do something or something you want to experience or something you want to do or some future event, it's an amazing phenomenon because our researchers are beginning to show that not only do we remember a past, but the brain actually can remember a future. And so how does it do that? Well, because the forebrain has connections to all other parts of the brain, it can take a little bit of that knowledge from a specific neural network and a little bit of experience and, and another neural network of knowledge and another neural network of experience, and it can seamlessly piece it together to create a new level of mind. And then your brain gets a picture or an image, and then you transfix your mind on that image and those neurons string into place that begin to fire and wire together. And every time you remind yourself of what you want to experience, you're reinforcing the circuitry in your brain to begin to install the hardware for you to actually experience that future event. In other words, the brain already looks like it's already had the event. Now that's super cool because it really says then that we're remembering a future potential. Now, feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences. And we can remember experiences better because we can remember how they feel. So when you're in the midst of an experience and you're seeing and smelling and tasting and feeling and hearing and you're immersed in the environmental cues, there is a rush of information that causes the brain to pattern into specific neural networks. And then there's a very strong emotional quotient that the brain releases to the body. So then, if feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences then, is it possible then to tune into that future potential and put so much of our attention on it till it's real? Mm -hmm. And the end product of that experience in our own mind is an emotion and we begin to feel how that event would actually take place or feel ahead of the actual experience. Now, we're no longer relying on the external world to change our internal chemistry. And then when we feel different, we look to see who or what caused it. What we're saying is now is that we're giving thanks ahead of the actual experience or we're falling in love to the point that the body is, as the unconscious mind, is getting the signal before the actual environmental experience. The body does not know the difference between the event in reality that produces the emotion and the emotion you create create by yourself. Now, here's the key. Most people use their senses to define reality. We all do. But the quantum model says we're going to use our mind to define reality and we're going to convince our body emotionally that that future event has already happened. Now, when your mind and body are working together, when your thoughts and feelings are aligned, you're in a state of being. And that state of being is what that flow is all about. Now, some people would say, oh, that's nonsense or that's so unrealistic. Well, it is nonsense. It's beyond the senses. Mm -hmm. And it is unrealistic because it isn't a reality yet. But you've already experienced it enough times that you can surrender now and let go because you already can trust that somehow it's going to happen. You don't know how or when, and that should never be your job because the moment you try to figure out how or when, you go back to that old identity trying to control the outcome. But if you understand that the quantum model says that there's an intelligence that will organize the event in a way that's right for you, and you've already experienced it enough times till you feel it on a cellular level, then you, already, you are in the state of experiencing it in terms of being it. And then when you're in that state of being, that is a personality. And your state of being is your personality, and your personality creates a new personal reality. So here's the beauty behind it. You can let go now and, and surrender to some greater intelligence and, and, and be tickled mm -hmm. by the outcome, because you can't be tickled unless you know, uh, unless you don't know when it's going to happen or where it's going to happen. But the physiology of tickling says that you can surrender and not know when or how and you'll be tickled. So the universe wants to tickle us in a certain way. We have 
emotions that are derived from stress chemicals that we call survival emotions. Those are emotions of anger and judgment and aggression and hatred and fear and anxiety and depression and pain and suffering. Those emotions are chemical signatures from a primitive nervous system called the fight or flight nervous system. Now, 90% of most people's thoughts and feelings come from those survival emotions. Yeah. And they are very low frequency emotions. And they tend to cause us to become more materialists. In other words, those chemicals cause us to define reality by our senses. And we start focusing on that point zero 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 one percent of reality, not on the 99.9999% of reality. So those emotions tend to be more dense. They endorse the ego to a large degree, and we become very selfish. We, we focus on our bodies. We obsess about things in our environment. We obsess about our hairstyles, our, you know, our body parts. We, we get over-focused about time. That's what those primitive chemicals do. Now. <clears throat> Most people consider that normal, right? Now, when you stop sending those chemical signatures to your body emotionally, when you say, today I'm not going to complain, I'm not going to blame, I'm not going to make excuses, I'm not going to feel sorry for myself, I'm not going to uh, judge anybody, I'm going to stop that. Well, what you're really saying is, is you're no longer going to feed your body those emotional cues that is going to cause it to become more dense, to become more heavy, to come slower, because your body is basically gravitationally organized energy that's sending and receiving information. Well, every time you have a lower frequency thought, you're causing your body to feel more dense, and that then causes you to feel more at effect of your external world. But when you make the decision to no longer send that energy to your body, in a sense, your body is no longer being enslaved by those emotions because on the short term, you know, those emotions are fine because they were, they were highly adaptive at one time if you were being chased by a lion or by a tribe mm -hmm. in some way. You better have some type of emergency mode to cause you to be aggressive or to, to run or to protect yourself. But it becomes highly maladaptive when you're trying to function in your world and it's happening all the time and you're reacting to everything. And here's the, here's the problem is that the more you react to things, mm -hmm. the more you're driving those chemicals to cause you to react even more. And then what happens is in the long term, we create that particular aspect of ourselves as a personality. We tend to memorize anger. We tend to uh, memorize sadness or depression. And then we say, I am depressed, I am angry. And what we're really saying, our mind and body are in unison to some type of thing. So when you begin to make the decision to no longer condition your body emotionally to those states, the body begins to become liberated. The chains of those emotions that are highly addictive ca keep causing the body to be knocked out of balance, it creates tremendous polarity. So when you begin to fast from those emotional states and you say, this isn't loving to me, living by this emotional state, and you start making those choices, as you inhibit those circuits from firing in your brain, nerve cells that no longer fire together, no longer wire together, you don't use them, you lose them. In other words, you are pruning away the old mind. Mm -hmm. And if every place where one a neuron connects with another neuron is a memory, you're releasing the memory of the old self. And if you're no longer emotionally conditioning the body to the same mind, every time you inhibit that state of victimization or suffering or pain, you're no longer signaling the gene in the same way that's causing the body to stay in its same, same physical state. Well, when you start liberating the body in that way, the absence of that emotional addiction is a tremendous release of energy. The body mm. is releasing the emotion now, and as it begins to release the emotion, the polarity begins to unify between positive and negative, good and bad, and that energy winds up right in your heart. And you start feeling inspired. You start feeling liberated. You start seeing things differently because the filter of how you are perceiving reality is being removed because the emotion is no longer causing you to view reality based on some past emotional state. And when you're running in those high emotional states, there's always a gap between how, you, how things appear and 
how things really are. The art perception is altered. So all of a sudden, you're seeing something in a more clear or more organized way. So when the, that heart starts to open, mm -hmm. then you're no longer living as a selfish individual. You're tending to live more selflessly. And you're considering everybody, because that's what love does. Love can, includes everybody. So getting to that point for a lot of people, uh, all of us, is the art. Because when we arrive at that place, we realize that, geez, I think I had this all wrong all, you know, all along here. And when we talk about opening the heart, um, it is a process of overcoming our limitations. And when we overcome some aspect of ourself and we liberate that energy and we're no longer addicted to that emotion, then we no longer can judge because there's, there isn't the chemistry to judge any longer. And, and so the body begins to reorganize itself into mo more coherent patterns. And those coherence energetically is what we call love. Mm -hmm.